answer. Out of reach, past all we can see, hear and touch, beyond all we understand, lies... <laughs> The Extraordinary. The Extraordinary is the story of twins Greta and Frieda Chaplin, two separate people who appear to share a single mind. Do you always know what the other one is going to say? We do, yes, we do, yes, yes. Greta, do you know what Frieda is, is, is going to say? So you, you talk with her? Yes. And Frida, do you know what Greta's going to say? It is the startling premonition of Jimi Hendrix's death, revealed by L.A. Law's Corbin Burnson. From that point on, that's when I started to... It was like the rude awakening that there's you know, something out there that's greater than what it is that I've known. It is the story of a young Aboriginal boy named Alan who lapsed into a coma. Modern medicine could not help. Alan had been sung into an ancient spell. If you break the law, you get punished for it. Well, the most severe one is to be sung and sung to death. It is the strange spirit that inhabits this landmark town hall. Town officials are too scared to enter alone. And never after dark. You really start to feel like there's somebody right behind you. The extraordinary is the frightening experience of this young country girl who believes she saw a monster in the Australian outback. It was just looking at me and then it just popped up and started to come towards me. Just some of the stories that lie beyond our normal understanding. Tonight, on the extraordinary. Good evening. I'm Warwick Moss. It is a concept as awe-inspiring as any human condition ever investigated by science. Two separate people sharing one mind. Think about it for a moment. Imagine you have a twin whose every thought is exactly the same as yours and comes at exactly the same time as yours. Someone who shares your instant reactions, your moment-by-moment -moment emotions. Someone who is you in every detail. The question is, could the two Chaplin sisters actually have one mind in two bodies? Alison Holloway in London had this remarkable encounter. <laughs> stick together? Yes, yes, yes. By whom? Over to my father. And what did they say to you? Always stick together? Yes. yes. Yeah, father's actually oh, father said that. He said that, said that. I brought you up and I always wanted you to stick together. So that I've obviously brought you up to stay together. And I always wanted you to do. And what did I say one day? I always want you to be good to each other. And you've always stayed close? Yes, yes. Be because your mum and dad said to stay close to one another? Yes. Mm. The bond between Greta and Frieda Chaplin goes far beyond what identical twins usually experience. In a bizarre sense, they're Siamese twins. They're not joined physically, but mentally they're one. 
They behave as one, they speak as one, they desperately want to be one person. What may have started off as a childhood game has turned into a lifelong obsession. Was he very strict to your own father? He was always drunk. I was drunk and things like that. Was your mother a happy woman? No, no. Did you sense that as children, that they weren't happy? Yes, yes. 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 Did it make you unhappy as children? Yes, yes. caught it, caught it, did, yes. Did that bring you closer, do you think? It's hard to say. As children, they were each other's best friend, each other's security. The twins insist on doing everything together and must be able to see each other at all times. If separated even for a moment, they become hysterical. They even try to walk in step. Today, they're so close that they sleep in a double bed. Pour boiling water from a kettle while both hold the handle. And dress identically. When buttons fail to match on two coats, the twins swap them around, so each had two green buttons and two black. Are you very careful about how you dress so you you look like one person? Yes, yes. Have you always done that? Yes, always, always. So if you went into a shop to buy something, you'd make certain that there were two yes, before yes, you yes, would yes, buy? Yes, yes. And if there weren't two, what would you do? Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Do you dress the same even down to... Yes, or, 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 the socks that you wear, yes, the tights that wish. you wear, yes. the shoes that you wear. Yes. When doing their household chores, they move about slowly and stiffly. When one moves, the other seems to be drawn to her by the very movement itself. The twins have developed a number of fixed rituals and routines which they keep to when they're in the house and which seem to reinforce the bonds and accentuate their dual actions which began in their childhood. Doctors report they've never before encountered such a case and say the twins are so close they almost seem linked by telepathy. Have you ever argued about anything? Not that we can't mend it. We always mend it if we do. We know not, not that we know not, not that we, we know that, never that we can't mend it. Do you know what we mean? Mm -hmm. So the arguments didn't last for very long. No. no. Has one of you been sick and the other one hasn't, and the other one's looked after the one that's been ill? Problems like that don't happen, though. Mm. Do you find that you get ill at the same time? Do you get cold at the same time? Yes. The twins now live in the East London suburb of Hackney. Their strange condition, having to be together 24 hours a day, makes holding normal jobs and leading normal lives almost impossible. They're reluctant to leave the house on their own. They're aware their behaviour attracts unwanted glances. Do you fear ridicule from the outside world? Well, we don't go out much when we're close to be this, that's all, that's all. Just be tough indoors, we 
Would you like to get out more? If somebody took us, yes. Somebody took us, yes. Yes. Somebody used to take them out regularly. A man called Jack Davenport, a retired textile engineer who invited them to share his house in London after reading about them in a newspaper. Jack was like a father figure. They loved him dearly. But Jack died last year. Did he fill a gap in your life? Yes, yes. yes. It's very sadly missed. Very sadly missed, yes. When they become stressed, they talk in unison, speaking the same words in identical voice patterns that create a weird echo effect. For a long time yet, he said, I won't go for a long time yet. Because he had no idea what was going to happen. No idea what was going to happen. So he said, I won't go for a long time yet. I'll be around for a long time yet. That's what he said. That's what he said. He said that I would put it, I'll be around for a long time. And was he? No, 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 no. He died shortly after that. Yes, yes, about six months yes. after. Yes, six months after he said that to him. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And he's the person that's got closest to you. Yes, yes. yes. How how close are you? Do you um, want to be together all the time? We do. Yes, we do. Yes, yes. Every single waking moment. Yes, yes. Have you ever been apart from one another? No. Ever? No, no. Hey, come here, come here, We did see them in a more cheerful mood at a hostel where the twins have formed a close attachment to four cats. what the other one is going to say. What we want to know, what we want to do and things, yes. Yes. Do you know what your twin is saying? Because you talk together, don't you? Yes, yes. Greta, do you know what Frida is, is, is going to say? So you, you talk with her? Yes. And Frida, do you know what Greta's going to say? Yes. The women's extreme closeness has intrigued the medical world, and some experts say they genuinely appear to share one mind between two bodies. We just look at, you know, we just look at our life as though there's only one of us, like one person. We don't go into all things you you go into. We don't go into. You don't want to do now, do you? No. Mm -hmm. So you are just just one person. Yes, that's how we look at it. Yes. And is that how you look at it yeah. too? Yes. Corbin Burnson is for most of us associated with the TV series LA Law. He's a bit of a legal scoundrel who spends as much time trying to get his divorcee clients into the bedroom as he does getting their ex-husbands into the courtroom. You'll be pleased to hear Corbin is nothing like that in real life. He's a devoted family man, but he does have a few surprises, especially in the world of the unexplained. To watch Corbin Burnson in L.A. Law, you'd expect him to be about as vulnerable to superstition as he is to the Ninth Commandment. To protect my boss. You're loyal. That's a rare quality. Mm. In real life, Burnson is the faithful husband of actress Amanda Pays and a dedicated father. Most people can't deal with it. They usually think when I'm talking to you now, they think I'm, you know, lying or bull. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah. But Burnson, the family man, isn't the only surprise. He was raised in a Christian science family by a mother who believed in the power of prayer to heal. And to this day, he relies on a heavy degree of spirituality 
in all phases of his life. It's funny, I think my mother and myself have this ability that when somebody is sick, I know my mother certainly does, and I can feel it sometimes that, and I'm not talking about healing and putting hands on, I don't want to get like all weird here, but, but if my child is sick, and my mother used to do this to me, you can put a hand on somebody and you can, I don't know, you can ease the, the disease, I don't want to call it the disease out, but I'm not saying I'm going to go heal, you know, none of that stuff. But, uh, but, you know, you can, I kind of hold my son sometimes when I know he has a little cold or something and say, just give me some of it, let me have it, you know, let me have it. Just, uh, you're better now, you're better now. And maybe it's nothing more than just easing him and when you're at rest, your body heals better. Bernson openly admits he's hooked on superstition. In a moment, we'll get to why he won't throw out a particular $50 bill and why he wore a banana sticker on his forehead for a month. But more dramatic was the first incident that convinced him there's more to our world than meets the eye. It happened the morning after the drug overdose death of 60s rock legend Jimi Hendrix. My brother and I shared a bedroom and we were into rock and roll music and Jimi Hendrix and the Stones and, and went to all the concerts. And then one day we had heard, I guess, that Jimi Hendrix was coming to play the Hollywood Bowl here in Los Angeles. And as I recall it, we had these bunk beds, you know, and I used to sleep up above my brother and he used to sleep down below. And he kind of looked up at me one morning and he said, we got to go get those Hendrix tickets today. we got to go get those Hendrix tickets for the Hollywood Bowl. And I kind of laid there for a minute and just felt weird. And I just kind of leaned over like you do on a bunk bed and looked down to him and I said, we can't, Jimi Hendrix is dead. And he said, what are you talking about, Jimi Hendrix is dead? dead. I said, Jimi Hendrix is dead. And then we both threw it off and we said, I, yeah. I said, I don't know what I'm talking about. Let's just, yeah, we'll go get the tickets a little later. And in the morning report on the news and the whatever, he had died six hours, what was during our night, he had died. Since that day, Bernson's kept an open mind toward unexplained phenomena and openly admits he's uncommonly superstitious. If you push Corbin Bernson a little more, he'll confess to maybe his most embarrassing superstition. It concerns one of the little sticker labels they put on Chiquita bananas. I have this Chiquita banana sticker they put on them, and I put it right here, and I still have this sticker. I put it in the middle of my forehead, and I wore it to school for about a month. I wouldn't take it off. I was scared to take it off. I showered with it. And more recently, there's the case of the wallet and the $50 note. I just went into all my old junk and started looking back and I'm a collector, like a major like collector, and I couldn't throw things away. I couldn't throw wallets away that when I was 13. I found a wallet that had $50 in it from 1986 that had TV on it right before I got L.A. Law. And it just had a T period and a V period. And I said, oh, this is a good luck sign. And I kept it and within weeks had L.A. Law. And, and it's funny, I went back and I don't re remember how or what, but I've never taken that $50 bill out of the wallet. And I, so the other day, I'm going through all this old junk, and I found this wallet, and I opened it up, and there's that bill, with $50 and the TV on it. And I thought, do I take the $50 out? And I said, no way, no way, it's still sticking, it's still in my wallet. The superstitions are all just small signs of a larger spirituality Corbin Burnson has felt since childhood, triggered, he suspects, by the Jimi Hendrix incident. At that point on, that's when I started to, it was like the rude awakening that there's you know, something out there that's greater than what it is that I've known. And uh, it was kind of my spiritual awakening. Coming up, the story of a young Aboriginal boy cursed by his own people and beyond the help of modern medicine. He suddenly sat straight up in bed. He just sat bolt upright and he screamed. And all he said was, I've got one minute to live. 
the landmark town hall that is home to a spirit that has town officials too scared to enter after dark. Came in this room here, next thing I know, there it is in the judge's chair. The story of a young girl who believes she saw a monster in the outback. Her story eerily similar to other sightings. A real dark blacky brown color, I suppose. Very woolly, very shaggy head. Ancient cultures and strange rituals have long fascinated modern man. The secrets of witchcraft, voodoo and medicine men have mystified through the ages. We tend to think of such things as foreign, but aboriginals have a long and powerful link to the psychic. Take the case of Alan, a young aboriginal boy who lapsed into a coma. Modern medicine could do nothing. Alan had been sung. For centuries, Aboriginal tribal elders have passed down their legends, their knowledge, from generation to generation. Outsiders have always been mystified by their powers, many of which seem to transcend scientific explanation. Those elders are said to have the power of life and the power of death. There is certainly a firmly held belief that, uh, that many deaths were the, re were the result of, um, of Aboriginal influences. But, uh, Randy Spargo uh, might has spent 20 years in the far northwest of Western Australia. He's now the resident doctor in Derby. Dr Spargo has seen a number of cases up here which have defied modern medicine. Cases where he believes Aborigines have been sung, punished according to tribal laws. There's a very rapid deterioration in their, in, in their physical and uh, mental condition. They go into decline very, very quickly. And uh, when that happens, it's probably too late. Back in 1989, Alan Bangmora, who was then 17 years old, suffered all those symptoms. He's convinced he wasn't physically ill, but something was eating away at his soul, his spirit, and he was dying. A tribal group somewhere was singing him, using immense mental powers to send a message of death across vast expanses of the Australian outback. Well, they sing songs, you know. They sing you to death, like they sing you to die. Alan Bangmora's crime was love. It seems his punishment was death. You see, the girl he chose came from another tribe, and she'd been promised to another man, not just any man, but a tribal elder. That, according to community leader Ken Kolbung, is a breach of ancient law, an unpardonable crime. Well, in, in breaking the law, he has uh, in some way um, dirtied the um, uh, bloodlines of the tribal group. The romance was short-lived. In a matter of weeks, Alan was left alone. His girlfriend had fled back to her own people. That's when Alan went off the rails, stole a car and ended up in Perth's Longmore Remand Centre. When he was committed to Longmore, Alan was a fit young man. Average weight, average height, and no known medical problems. That was until one night in May 1989. So the next morning I couldn't get up. I was just all started getting weak, all burned up. And my heart, my head was hot, and the eye was blurry, you couldn't see. I was just laying there and just couldn't do nothing. The remand centre's nurse, Judy Long, began to suspect that this was not a straightforward illness. It was not one that pills could cure. And then he was holding his, uh, the left side of his chest and he was pulling, he was really pulling at his chest and complaining about um, a red stone that was stuck in his chest. 
And then after that he was talking about a, a feather that was uh, behind his left ear, which sort of led me to believe what I'd been thinking all along, that this, um, this young man had been, been sung. He suddenly sat straight up in bed. He just sat bolt upright and he screamed. And all he said was, I've got one minute to live. And then he went back into the bed. He just laid straight back down again. And he went uh, a grey colour. Um, it was just something I'd never seen uh, an Aboriginal do before. I'd never seen someone that dark go that pale before. And it was, um, was quite a shock. Judy Long knew Alan needed help, and needed it quickly. An ambulance rushed the boy across Perth to Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, where he was admitted to intensive care. 48 hours later, young Alan was still in a coma. The doctors had tried everything, but modern medicine had failed them. All their tests, all their technology, couldn't tell them what was wrong. So in desperation, they turned away from the present and sought wisdom from the past. There is a tribal law in every tribe that if you break the law, you get punished for it. Well, the most severe one has to be sung and sung to death. This is the man the hospital called in, a man some might call a witch doctor. He is, in fact, an Aboriginal elder who says he has the power to unsing, to cast off evil spells. Never before has he spoken about these ancient skills, and by doing so now, he believes his life could be in danger. Well, it's all in my hands. See? When I um, put, put my hand on anybody, I can fix them up. And as I run my hands through anybody, I can take the power out, break the spell. The elder was flown from his tribal area up north to Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, where he was taken to see the boy, still in intensive care, still in a coma. The doctor knew that I was coming, and they just told me that they'd leave us for 20 or 30 minutes. And I just uh, talked to him myself and um, rubbed him over and he was good as gold. Only two people know exactly what happened in that hospital room. The elder says the treatment is a secret that belongs to his people and his people alone. Alan Bangmora is still bewildered and his memory of those few minutes is hazy. This man has told me I'll just lay in the bed. I'll fix you up. So he just took off my shirt told me to close my eyes. Then I was opening, opening up my eye and, and he was there just rubbing my guts, my feet, my head. Just like he was just pulling out all these things, you know, like, like I could feel it coming out. I said, oh, you're right now, I fixed you up. The spell was broken. Alan's life was spared. He knew he had escaped death, yes. Alan's 21 now and lives in Derby. He knows he made a mistake and went close to paying the ultimate price. Alan truly believes that he broke an ancient law and it was only an ancient power that saved him. The white doctors, they don't know what's going on. They can't... Um, fix anybody up. That's because it's all uh, sort of invisible. It's a spiritual thing. The mind is being taken over by the spiritual uh, singing. I think it's a powerful uh, force in, uh, in uh, any, any group where superstition plays an important role in their everyday lives and uh, it's uh, not to be denied and shouldn't be uh, underestimated as to it, the powerfulness of that.
great ghost stories along the craggy coast and dark woods of the American Northeast. This one began a half a century ago, about a strange spirit that inhabits the landmark town hall in the village of Alton, New Hampshire. And it's still going. The witness list is impressive. The town's chief of police, the town planner, and oh yes, the town clerk. She's just one of several Alton town officials who refuse to enter their own town hall alone and never after dark. The police station of Alton, New Hampshire was in the town hall basement. The chief, Thomas Minswa, was on duty late at night when he heard it. I heard noises and I came upstairs to investigate and it sounded, because you could very distinctly tell, front front door closing and opening because it slammed, it was so heavy, and you could tell if somebody was walking in the hallway. And being downstairs, uh, we would come upstairs to see if who was in the building, because uh, at the time the building upstairs was closed. And coming upstairs you'd find no one. Alton's town planner, Glenn McLean, is not the kind of man given to wild imagination. He's experienced it too. You really start to feel like there's somebody right behind you. Uh, there are some physical things that happen. You feel your hair start to stand up on end. You, you feel that presence. The local radio personality, Scott McKay, stayed in the town hall overnight. He thought to dispel the myth. My impression coming in was one of skepticism, not too sure what I would find. Um, I really didn't have a fixed thought on whether I believed in uh, any supernatural or not. And when I left the next morning, I still wasn't too sure, but I do know that something happened. And Alton's town historian, Judith Fry, is just about ready to include the ghost in official records. I think it's happened too many times just to be, uh, just to be a coincidence. And I think um, there's really some, some merit in it. It usually happens sometime after midnight. And it continues until two or three o'clock in the morning. These are the hours of the Alton Town Hall ghost. By day, the old town hall is typical of any stately historic site you might find in a small town of New England. This one stands with town pride. Its 100th anniversary is coming up, and a celebration like Alton hasn't seen for many years is planned. Some townsfolk are wondering if the big event might stir something unexpected, even unwanted, in the old landmark. The people who live daily with the town hall ghost are certain about two things. It exists, and if you don't bother it, then it doesn't bother you. While the Alton town hall haunting seems unthreatening, no ghost story of recent times has had more credible or official witnesses. The people who believe it most fervently are the city officials and police. They live with it. When you distinctly hear footsteps and you know them to be footsteps and hear the same type of noise and come up and not find anybody, check all the doors in the offices, find them all closed, and check the building and there's nobody there, um, makes you wonder. There were a lot of times when things disappear. You go crazy looking for them because you're sure that they were where you left them. You look around, you can't find them, you come back and they were where you left them. And uh, you start asking yourself some questions. A lot of the city employees who work in the town hall by day refuse to enter the building alone and never after dark. Good morning. I survived the night at the Alton Town Hall. The radio announcer Scott McKay thought he was going to make fun of the whole affair when he stayed alone in the building overnight. 
When I left, I left with the last employee. She was going off to a class. I was going out to get something to eat before I came back to settle in for the night. You locked the doors? Locked it up. I had the supposedly the only key that I know of. Lights were out. Everything was turned off except the entrance light. Yet when he returned, everything had changed. When I came up to the room, all my stuff was gone. My whole gear, my sleeping bag, my knapsack. So I started looking around, came in this room here. Next thing I know, there it is in the judge's chair. After finding his sleeping bag, he noticed his TV set was also gone. After I retrieved my knapsack, I came over to the stairway here, and down at the bottom of the stairway was my monitor. Nothing wrong with it. It wasn't broken. It just looked like it had been placed down there. All night long, he heard footsteps when no one was there, noises that no one was making, felt a presence that made his hair stand on end. Even though I was lying here on the floor, um, supposedly alone in the building, something told me that I wasn't alone. What he encountered was consistent with everything the police chief and his men had been quietly telling each other for years. They would find lights on in the building as they drove past and turn around to come back to check them and the lights would be out. The sound of doors slamming has been a constant unexplained noise for anyone who stayed alone in the town hall after dark. The cell door in the old basement police station has been a sobering reminder that Alton's most famous building is never quite empty. And the dogs. The stories about the police dogs are what spooks the town planner Glenn McLean most of all. The dog would want to respond to something upstairs. The officers on duty would take the dog upstairs and let the dog run. It would go down the main hall on the first floor of the building, hit the steps that lead to the second floor, go about two steps up and stop. The question of whose spirit occupies the town hall has never been answered. One story is that a city elder responsible for the town clock long ago was killed in the tower. Another concerns a woman named Sarah Glidden. Like witches of old, she's buried beneath granite in the town cemetery. Some think her spirit has escaped. In 1825, a lady by the name of Sarah Glidden, who was a resident of East Alton, was struck down on a clear day by lightning and was killed. This incident has been documented in the church record. Whatever walks the corridors of Alton Town Hall at night, the townsfolk either don't want to know or don't want to disturb it. I want to be on the record with the ghost as being respectful of it because I believe it is here. With the Town Hall's big centennial celebration coming up, the people of Alton just hope the ghost enjoys a party. Julie Clark is an average girl, not prone to make up stories. But for a couple of years, country girl Julie has had to do battle with disbelievers. You see, back in 1990, Julie says she saw a monster. These are the gentle sloping hills around Crambeck, a little village nestling in the mountain ranges, some 300 kilometres northwest of Sydney. It's real rural Australia, a quiet place with just a main street, a pub, a post office, a general store, and not much else. It's where Julie Clark grew up. She's an independent soul, a country kid who learned to ride almost as soon as she could walk. Julie's now 15, and according to her mother, not the kind of girl who'd make up a monster story. Julie's a very sensible girl and very trustworthy and pretty well liked around town. For centuries, Man has been fascinated by legendary monsters. The abominable snowman, first sighted by Europeans 160 years ago. Bigfoot in North America. And the Yowie, which has been reported more than 3,000 times from one end of Australia to the other. 
Through these cool green eyes, Julie Clark saw what she believes was a yaoi, a hairy human-like creature. It challenged her, chased her, and burnt an impression on her brain, which is still as clear as any photograph. Julie is certain she's seen a creature from the unknown. And some people, like, they don't even think, and, you know, they just laugh straight away and that. But I don't really take any notice because I know I've seen something and I don't see things. It was a summer's day in 1990, a day that was to change Julie Clark's life. Julie's horse was the first to sense that something was wrong. It started to act up, snorting and rearing. Suddenly, Julie was faced with something unknown. It was just looking at me, and then it just hopped up and started to come towards me. Yeah, it was um, sort of like a gorilla or something. It was sort of like a huge man, but it had hair all over it. Well, I was just really shooken up, and then I just quickly turned the horse, and I just turned around and just bolted home and just never stopped. I just went flat out all the way. Its face was really ugly and hairy. When it went to stand up, it was... I don't know, it was heaps bigger than the horse. Yeah, come on. Come on. It's yeah. true some were sceptical, but not yeah. Alwyn Richards. On, He's yeah. lived in the district for more than 40 yeah. years, and back in 1976, he saw something, a vision that still puzzles him. It was quite, oh, a real dark blacky brown colour, I suppose. Very woolly, very shaggy head. And the smell was, oh, a very stinking more uh, electrical sort of smell that, and then like, like a, oh, I don't know, sort of hard to describe, but a very stinking sort of smell, something that's not, not natural, not a natural animal smell that you'd normally smell around. And Alwyn Richards isn't the only one. There's been another remarkably similar sighting, a sighting by a local businessman. He agreed to tell his story, but he did ask to remain anonymous. All the grass was completely flattened and there was like a circle of trees to make a good hiding place for something. But all the grass was totally flattened and there was a very strong, like a burnt Bakelite electrical smell in there and sort of sent shivers up my spine and I hightailed it out of there too. So, Julie Clark is not alone in seeing this beastly phenomenon. A phenomenon that no one around here can explain. Although the quiet surrounds of Cranback may look picture postcard perfect, there's one young girl growing up in this small rural community who believes with all her heart that there is a creature from the unknown somewhere in those hills. Story of a woman who shocked a courtroom with claims she could undergo major surgery without anaesthetic. She could turn off the pain by willpower. And she produced videotapes to prove it. An untold story, next week. That's all we've got time for tonight. Just before we go, I'd like to show you another story from next week's show. It's about a young Melbourne couple who married in Britain at the end of last year. When they got their wedding photos back, there he was, the ghost of Chiddingly Church. Freaked me out when I first saw it. Oh, I hope he was a good one. <laughs> I showed it to people at work and the hairs on their arm literally stood on end and they looked at it.